Hey guys, Mel O here, and you're about to hear from Rory Kaplan, longtime music industry veteran and keyboardist for Michael fucking Jackson. Now, Rory shared with us a whole ton of wonderful stories that normally we would save only for our patrons. However, his stories are so wonderful, we wanted to make sure that all our listeners had a chance to hear them. So if you wait around at the end of the episode, in a couple seconds, we're going to tack on all of the stories that normally we would set aside only for our patrons. We hope you enjoy them, and we can't wait to have Rory back on the show. As fantastic a CFP as Mel O is, as wonderful an attorney as I am, and as good as Stormy is at whatever it is he does, please do note that anything said in our podcasts are our opinions alone and are not meant to be taken as financial or legal advice. Welcome to Finances, the other F word, a Gen Xer podcast for musicians and music lovers where we discuss money and music without all the pretentious bullshit. Here are your hosts, Zoe Terry, attorney at large, Stormy Andrews, founder of Yoko Local Marketing, and Mel O, certified financial planner and author of Finances, the other F word. Listener discretion is advised. Hey guys, welcome to Finance is the Other F Word. And holy shit, you guys, you have no fucking idea who is on the show with us today. Rory Kaplan. Okay, so let me just give you a little bit about Rory right now so you guys know who the fuck you're about to hear from. First of all, he started at 19 with Chick Korea playing keyboards. Yes? Well, I was his keyboard technician and I mm-hmm. programmed his synthesizer sounds and did about 11 albums with him. Fantastic. And. Tour. And he is currently working with Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis on their first solo album. He is also the head of business development for Iron Mountain Entertainment Services, helping musicians, attorneys, and estates gather assets to monetize them. And he just happened to be the fucking keyboardist on the Bad and Victory Tours with Michael Jackson. So for those of you on YouTube... You see my I love MJ shirt. Hell yeah. Take a picture of that. That's beautiful. Rory, God, we are so freaking excited. So let's start with how you, I, I don't know if you audition with, oh, and by the way, I just want to let you guys know, we have uh, some lag that's working here. We're all still working remotely. So it's just going to have to be what it's going to be. I can't edit out the lag. So if there's lag, you just deal with it because I can't do anything no about it. So when, so tell me how the whole Michael Jackson thing, like even, how did how does that even go down? Do you get called for an audition? I mean, what happens? It was, it, it's I'll, I'll make it as short as I can. It's hard for readers digest version, but I was working with Fairlight, which was the first keyboard that could record a sound and play it back on the keyboard, and you can manipulate it. It's what Peter Gabriel used on a lot of stuff on his album So an Intruder. Um, Jermaine Jackson had just bought one. I was using one with Stevie Wonder. I was out on tour with Stevie Wonder uh, for a a fall with Christopher Cross into Stevie Wonder on the Fairlight. And then Jermaine heard about me through Stevie and Jermaine bought a Fairlight and Fairlight recommended that I would, would I train Jermaine? And so Jermaine was married to Hazel Gordy, Barry Gordy's daughter at the time. And I would go up to their house up in, in, in the Beverly Hills area and I started showing Jermaine how to use it. And after about two or three visits, he just looked at me and he goes, I'm never gonna learn this. My brothers and I are doing a tour next year. Do you wanna go on the tour with us? And, and I was like, the Jackson? Okay. <laughs> yeah. and, and so, I mean, I was, I was like so dumbfounded because it was, seemed surreal to me. Right. Because Jermaine's just talking about this gig they're gonna do. I hear the Jacksons, and mind you, Thriller had just come out. Oh, wow. So, so Thriller's at, it, it, this is October or, or November, October, November of 83. So anyways, months go by and I'm listening to the radio. We had a, a FM station here, Rick Dees, would, we had a pop <laughs> radio show. And Rick Dees is going, yes, you know, the Jacksons are getting ready to tour and they're rehearsing now in LA. And I went, oh, shoot, I guess I missed that one. You know, they, they got who they needed, that's fine. So two weeks goes by since they were hyping all this on the radio. And it was a Saturday morning. I get a call from Jermaine and he's in London. He said, hey, Roar, it's Jermaine. I'm in London. I want you to call my brother at this rehearsal studio number. Uh, you're going to 
play the Fairlight. And I was like, okay, call the, call the rehearsal place. I got their tour manager, this wonderful man, Nelson Hayes, had this great deep voice. And, and he came back 10 minutes later, he goes, we already have all our keyboard players. And I said, okay, thank you. you know. So I left a message back on Jermaine's home answering machine. And he called me Sunday and said, if you're not doing the tour, I'm not doing the tour. I'll meet you there Monday. <laughs> so I met Jermaine at the, it was Leeds rehearsal in North Hollywood. And it's where a lot of the tours would rehearse. And I walk in and I meet Randy and Tito and Jackie and Marlon and, and um, Michael wasn't there. He was at the White House with President Reagan because they were doing that anti-drug uh, program at the time. Mm -hmm. So I met the other members of the band and it's where the Pat Leonard story comes in. And I, Pat Leonard would become the big producer for Madonna and all her hit songs. But he immediately didn't like me and neither did the other keyboard player because they had to audition and go through this whole audition thing. Jermaine walks me in. So the animosity was just thick <laughs> as it could be. And, but, you know, it's like, I, I didn't know how to, I just did what I did. So I brought my keyboard the next day. I opened up at the beginning of Beat It. I started, I had the sounds already programmed on my keys and did the beginning of Beat It. I had the voices for Billie Jean already programmed and, and a bunch of songs they had. And it just it was great. And then Michael showed up about four days later with his manager, Frank DeLeo and, and his bodyguard, Chucky, who was like six, eight, and with a top hat was like seven something mm -hmm. and probably about 400 pounds of just muscle. And, and they walked in and Michael couldn't have been nicer. He met everyone in the band for the first time and it was great. So that was my introduction to them. I went back with Chick Corea with a project of his called the Electric Band in 85, 86 through the first half of 87. And then I got a call from Frank DeLeo around March while I was on the tour with Chick saying, Michael's thinking about doing his first solo tour. Are you interested? Uh, yeah. 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 Oh, I mean, <laughs> I mean I yeah. Michael who, I'm sorry. Yeah. Michael. Michael who, not ringing a bell, not ringing a bell at all. So I, he said, it's not definite, but I just want to see if you were available. I said, okay. So I'm out on tour with Chick and I realized if I'm going to do this, I got to give Chick notice and get someone to take my place and train them and teach them how to program everything. So I waited another few weeks and I let Chick know. And I called Frank DeLeo back and he says, yeah, it's looking good. I can't guarantee it. So I said, I'm going to gamble on this. So I told Chick, I need to give you two weeks. And we brought a guy out that, that Chick trusted and, and I trained him and it all worked well. And I flew home and I remember I had Michael's production office number. He had an office at the house in Havenhurst in Encino, uh, where his family, where his mom, you know, uh, parents lived in. And he had an office there. And I called and this girl, Candace, or Candy, answered the phone. And she was so nice to me, like, Rory, oh my God. I'm like, what? She goes, oh, how are you? I said, great. And she goes, uh, are you calling about the gig? And I said, yeah. She goes, well, officially, I can't tell you anything. Unofficially, you got the gig. Uh, and I wow. screamed. Like I was like a little 16 year old girl meeting McCartney in 1960. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. If somebody yeah. fucking tells you you're going and, on tour with Michael Jackson. Yeah, I'd have wet myself. Me too. It was, that, it was that beautiful. Didn't know all the parameters, but then Michael asked me to put the band together. Um, and what it meant is, will you audition everybody? Now, I didn't know this, but at the time they were talking to Greg who is the best musical director there is. Um, they didn't tell us that. They were negotiating with Greg, but they weren't sure they were gonna get Greg or not, or if Greg was gonna agree to terms or not. So they didn't tell me anything. They just said, Rory, put the band together. So we had a drummer who I'd worked with with Stevie, Ricky Lawson, who had a jazz group called the Yellow Jackets, and he also was Stevie Wonder's drummer for a while. And I had done a lot of work with Ricky. And then uh, this guitarist, John Clark, who was a stand-in because Madonna was on tour and she had the drummer, Jonathan Moffat and guitarist, David Williams, who were Michael's main rhythm section. That was Michael's sound. David Williams was a guitarist on Wanna Be Starting Something. He also was this, this, on Billy Jean, that's him. Um, he, he was just ridiculous. He was like a human clock. And the way he played, you just had to dance. And that's what Michael loved. So. They were both out on tour with Madonna. So we had stand-ins who were so good 
that Michael just loved who they were. And the other guys, it was going to take much longer because they had extended Madonna's tour. And Michael went, I'm happy with this band. So they wound up being permanent members. And then three weeks into rehearsing, Greg Filling Games comes in and we, all our jaws dropped. And we're like, Greg Filling Games, because all of us musicians, I don't know, for an attorney, it would be like, you know, you get to hang out with Tom Mesro and Johnny Co Cochran for a dinner. You know, you get to pick their brain. You know, Greg Filling Games is that guy to me. He's the, when I listen, she's out of my life and listen to that piano, that's Greg. Or, or, or you listen to Man in the Mirror, that's Greg. Like, wow. like he yeah. just can do anything and everything. And his bass playing on a synthesizer, again, on all of my, like, like Thriller and all those things that Greg did are just ridiculous. And so, and then Quincy Jones out and so on. So when he walked in, we were, you know, just blown away. And then it goes from there. Then, then I was a student of Michael and Greg from that point on. You know, so I programmed our sounds with my team. I did all the programming of all the keyboard sounds with uh, Tim Meyer and my guy, Eddie Reynolds and these guys. And then Greg took on the full musical director and taught me notes I never knew existed. <laughs> so it was pretty amazing. So uh, wow. I'm, just, I'm just, I know it's fucking crazy. I, and this is, this is the, the, the stories that I, I want to get to. And this is the one thing that I, I never got to see Michael in concert. Actually, I think, Zoe might have actually seen you on tour, Rory. I I saw. I, I'm pretty sure it was a bad tour. Did Kim Wilde support? She him? opened up to us in, in yeah. a few shows in Europe. Yeah, she I was, saw. The, yeah, I went. I saw. Um, in fact, I was very naughty. It was a friend's boyfriend, and she dumped him. Um, but he had tickets for Michael Jackson, and so I guess I shouldn't have. But I'm like. Uh, I'm going to go with the friend's boyfriend to see Michael Jackson. So I went, I saw him at Wembley um, yeah, and, and Kim, Kim Wilde was, was supporting. Was she was great. fantastic too. Yeah. We would go get fish and chips and talk about Scready Paletti because they were my favorite band. And oh, wow. Her, yeah. And it was her favorite band at the time. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, but yes, yeah, she was great. Both Taylor Dane and, and Kim Wilde would open up various shows in Europe with us on that tour. Mm-hmm. So, so since I never had the fortune to see uh, uh, MJ in concert, I've seen obviously video. I've seen all his videos. I have uh, all of his number one video hits, and and um, I love him to death. But there was, you know, there's the one. It's part of his live concert footage, and I can't remember which one it is. Where, and I I think it might have been on the Thriller tour, but where he comes out and he's wearing like the military thing with his glasses on, and he's just standing there. And it's like, he's building the suspense. Then he like barely takes off his glasses and like everybody erupts. So, so you're, so it does, it does Michael get on stage before you or do, does, does the band get on stage first? How does that work? What, what we were all, um, so what happens is on the, on the victory tour with his brothers, it was really interesting. They built the stage completely flat and they had an opening presentation. Jim Henson had these, big oversized Muppets type things like these, these big monsters made. And it was called the Cretons and it was an amazing thing. So wow. we're all under the stage at our rigs. And as the show opens up, the tops of the stage slide apart and the band members in their different slots all come up on, on these hydraulics up. And then these staircases came up with the Jacksons at the top of the staircase and these huge aircraft landing lights in back of them. So all you see is, you're squinting while seeing silhouettes of them. And again, the sunglasses would come off after I did the footsteps on the fair light as they walked down. So it sounded like a, like a, like a bunch of, you know, mastodons coming down the stairs <laughs> and then the lights would go down, the spotlights were on them. And then as they took their glasses off, uh, Jonathan would hit the beginning of start and something, bat, 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 to do, 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 you know? And so that would start the show on the bad tour. We quietly got on stage while it was pitch black. Mm -hmm. And then this big drop down, huge, like diamond vision screen was all lit up, animating Michael's moonwalk. So it looked like it was his feet moonwalking and you hear this shh, shh, as, as the feet are moving and the lights are really bright. Then we hit these chords that drone that just build the audience up and they put the subwoofer in with it 
and our keyboards are shaking the whole stage and the whole thing. And then Michael comes up and then everyone goes nuts. And again with the sunglasses, tosses them out. And Ricky does the dun, dun, dun. And then all of a sudden the whole band comes in with starting something. And then the lights back off and, and, and then the show starts. And so, it, I mean, again, Michael's concept of how to do these shows, he gave the audience, like, talking about knowing how to pay attention to what your audience wants. Michael was one, like money 101. So the band loved the song Speed Demon, which was on the Bad album. Yep. Now uh -huh. the first leg of the Bad tour was Japan and Australia and Bad hadn't been released yet. So we did almost a continuation of the Victory tour where it was still most of Michael's songs from my Off the Wall Thriller and a couple of Jackson hits. When we came back, Michael wanted to get rid of all the Jackson songs and just do Michael Jackson songs. Uh, the only time we did a Jackson song was in the med medley. We did a Motown medley in the middle of the show where we did, I want you back, the love you save, and I'll be there. And, and so we worked up Speed Demon during a break. And Speed Demon was not an easy song to play. It was all 30 second notes and horn parts that I had to play that were like on the real album, I think they were played at half speed and then they sped them up a little bit and because they're really tricky, intricate notes. But Greg started us at half speed just to get our fingering and our dexterity, just to muscle memory the, the notes because it wasn't an easy song to pull off live. And then we just sped it up and sped it up till, in fact, Donnie Osmond came to our rehearsal to watch us play that and he was blown away. We presented it to Michael. We, got, we couldn't find a rehearsal place in California. They were all booked, the Long Beach Arena, the Forum, all the other big arenas in California were booked. So we went to Pensacola, Florida, the Civic Center Arena, and we played it for Michael. And Michael was thinking about it. He loved how it went. But the financial side, there was a couple of things. How do I present this to the audience? It was an animation video. It was him with the, with the cartoon rabbit and, and all these things in that video. So how is he going to present that? And he didn't want to do anything cheap with the audience. Mm -hmm. So every song that he wanted in that show was geared towards if he's in the audience, how would he like to hear himself? How does the audience perceive him? What are the hits to him? And that's how he presented the songs to the audience. Even with Thriller, how we pulled it off live and so on. They were... Um, it's like every song was choreographed, even the pacing of the show, you know, when we did Human Nature or when we did Rock With You or when we did Working Day and Night, like all those songs were integrated where he knew the audience could pace with him. Mm -hmm. And so, cause he didn't want any reviews that went, yeah, the audience got lost after the first three hits or it went this way or that way. Or, or the, he just sat there and went, okay, how's an audience gonna look at this? So as much as he wanted to do Speed Demon, it didn't fit how he could present it to the audience where they'd be blown away. It would just be up there singing, doing this really cool song with a great, great group of musicians who could pull it off, but it wouldn't mean anything to a four-year-old kid or the 90-year-old grandmother, because that was the audience. The audience was, I look in the first, you could see the first six rows from the stage. After that, it was like you were blinded out. There were two to four-year-old kids with their moms, grandparents with their kids, it was the most diverse audience I've ever seen at mm -hmm. every show. Wow. So at what point do you go, I'm fucking playing with Michael Jackson? You know, and it's funny when it hit me, there's, there's, uh, uh, there's two little stories that go with it when it actually hit me. When you're doing it and you're in it, you're just focused on the hard work because it, it mm -hmm. wasn't a cakewalk. Like you, the dedic, we did a lot of 24 hours, just the programming alone, my team, they were wiring, we were programming, we were, you know, learning parts like we were, it was, there was, I would say out of, out of a, we got the show off the ground. We started auditioning July 8th of 87. We were on tour in Japan the first week of September. We put that whole production together. Uh, Michael was aside with the dancers and singers. We, the band was just learning our stuff. It all came together. Greg joined the band on the third week. And by the fourth week, we were a locked in band. 
That's how good Greg was with everybody. Wow. We all met. Then we left the rehearsal place in North Hollywood, went to Hollywood to uh, Francis Ford Coppola Studios. I think it was called Zotrope. And we all got there. We worked out our choreography, our staging, our sound, any tweaks we had to do. Um, and then we went from there to Universal Studios for a huge sound stage where we could have all the lights and all the sound and, and run it through. Then we went to Japan and it was game on. So, um, so now we're, we're just working, like we're working, working, working. You're doing the tour. You're, you're just every day there was business and, and, you know, rehearsal notes. I would record all my rehearsals and shows so I could make notes what to improve and sounds and so on. When it hit me, it was, I, I was actually a fan and not the guy in the band. And what happened, and, and you'll laugh and you'll appreciate this. So we've watched Michael do the moon dance pretty much since the Motown 25 special. Mm -hmm. I right? saw that live. Oh, so and, great. And, and when you watch that, you, you just go, that's inhuman, but you know, and he got it from the street dancers who were already sort of doing that. He just perfected it. Anyways, we had been doing all these shows and then Billy Jean, Michael would have this big spotlight, follow him on the moonwalk, go back. And then he'd go in circles like, as if he was on a round conveyor belt. And it looked amazing. And so one day we were in Würzburg, Germany. So we're well into the, we're halfway in the tour. And I'm still just in the mindset of play my parts, don't mess up. There's a million buttons I have to hit between each song. And we're doing Billie Jean. And I played the main dun, 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 dun. You know, I was doing the voice things that do that. And my keyboard was a double keyboard in front of me. So we were up on riser so I could, I could see down to Michael, but from his knees down, I couldn't see what his feet were doing. So we're doing Billie Jean, and I don't know where Michael got this from or how long he'd been practicing this, but all of a sudden he's facing the audience, and I see him just going, just cross the stage with no movement from the knees up. So <laughs> I'm looking over my keyboard to see if the road crew put a conveyor belt in the stage. <laughs> and for real, I lost my place in the song. And I went, oh, no. oh no. And so the main part drops out for about three or four bars. And I'm like, oh no, I'm gonna get fired. And I was scared to death. And because I was so overwhelmed watching Michael, I've never seen anything like that. So now I'm the fan and I got caught with my, you know, my hand in the cookie jar, like you're not supposed to do this. So I heard where the, drum, the bass line was and I came back in on the right beat and everything was fine. And after the show, Michael said, what happened? Oh, wow, he heard it. Oh, oh shit. Oh. Oh Even yeah! Even no. while he's performing, My, yeah, he's Michael, still... while he's performing, Michael hears he every part. There, there's no fooling this guy. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you. Even you could be doing a part that David Lee, like you know, like in uh, uh, Billie Jean, -ding 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 -ding, you know, all those little things. If it wasn't played exactly the way, Michael would stop and say, "Let's get this right." Like there was no gray area with Michael. He knew what he wanted. So when I fell out. I could have said, oh, my computer crashed. Oh, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I, and I thought, look, you know, I've never lied about that stuff. And, and, and I'm, I'm not going to make my road crew get in trouble. So I, I just said, Michael, I'm sorry. I said, I, you were doing this move across the stage. I thought the road crew put a conveyor belt there. And I looked over my keyboard tonight and he started laughing. <laughs> and I thought I was going to get fired. I really did. And he started laughing. And I said, it won't happen again. And, and so that was one of those beautiful moments, you know, where, where right. I, I, I was a fan for three seconds and it threw me off my game because, you know, all these months I've been like a robot just playing the stuff, not a robot, but I mean, I knew the stuff so well that I didn't think I could ever make a mistake, but right. he threw me off because it was so amazing. The next time I realized I was with Michael was our last gig in Europe. We played at a football open stadium arena in Liverpool. 175,000 people. Wow. Holy and we shit. walked up on the stage and I'm looking at Greg and Chris Carell, who's our, was playing the Sinclavier. And I'm looking, we're looking at each other and we're looking at this audience as far as your eye can see. And I went, we're with Michael Jackson. Wow. And, and I mean, yeah, there was a lot of, you know, of course, you know, you're with him and, and you're proud of it. And we never took it for granted, but it just didn't hit you until certain things. I mean, even like, I didn't even think about seven sold out shows at Wembley. I can't even imagine the money that was made 
at those shows. You know, that was the last thing on my mind. But I didn't know we broke a record. We were just playing gigs, you know. And then after the tour, you find out that no one's broken the record since or before. Mm-hmm. You know, Genesis came close. I forgot, you know, uh, I think Foo Fighters played a couple of nights there, but no one's done seven shows there. So so those are the things that, you know, you know, I, I wish I had a percentage of that tour. I <laughs> yeah, I bet. <laughs> yeah, I know a great right. CD who could uh, help you with all of that. Right. <laughs> I, I just, I mean, I love, I love Michael. I remember the Thriller album coming out. It was on tape and this is when I lived in Florida and I had the, you know, the little tiny boom boxes and my, my grandparents had to buy me Thriller at least four times because I kept leaving like a jackass. I kept leaving my little boom box outside with the humidity and everything in Florida. And then oh. of course, remember tapes kept getting eaten all the yeah. time. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I remember just listening to that, that tape and just, and loving it. And I watched Motown 25. And I mentioned this on our being black in America episode, I think, because my grandparents were, they were a little prejudiced and um, they, we only had to, two televisions. They had a little black and white one. And then they had the big one living room. And I wanted to see, you know, this show. So I was like in second, what year was that, babe? Was that it? Rory? Was that like 82 or three? Uh, I think it was a Motown special. Um, I'm trying to think it was, was it later? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, maybe eighty one or two. Can you Google it real quick, Stormy? I'm curious. Yeah, because I was in my grandparents' bedroom and I was watching it, and I love Michael Jackson, and it was this little tiny screen, and I'm like as close to it as I can possibly get. And then he hits it, and then he does that, and I was like, "What?" You know? And my little like second or third grade brain just blew a fuse. And I and then when I went to school the next day, everybody was talking about it. The people who had watched it and stuff. It was eighty three. Eighty three. Okay, yeah. so I was in third, third or fourth grade in eighty three, and and that was that was just amazing. So what is, so what what was it like to? So you had sent me long time ago, and they're on my old phone. You had sent me two pictures, Rory. I don't know if you remember. Yeah. Yeah, you sent me one, which was your concert promotional photo with all of you guys. And then the other one was you guys somewhere and you were, Michael was in a bumper car and you were in a bumper car and he looked like he had just rammed you from behind and you're laughing. You have a big smile (laughs) on your face. So what, what was he, I mean, like I see his videos now and like, even at the, you know, uh, rock, uh, you rock my world where him and Chris Tucker are talking at the beginning, you can hear the shyness in his voice. And then of course, soon as the music starts and he starts dancing it all goes away. So what was the main thing that you experienced working with Michael Jackson, that nobody would know that side of him, um, that would be something that you could tell somebody who's like a diehard MJ lover, what it was like to know the man himself. Well, he enjoyed having fun. Like, I, I mean, he literally was an adult with the heart of a 10-year-old who just wanted to explore the world. That meant practical jokes. It meant amusement park things. It meant learning how to dance new moves. Like, like just it was like he was exploring everything as if it was a new journey for him. That's how I, I saw him. So in that picture I sent you, <clears throat> we there was a we had a day off in in Gothenburg, Sweden, mm. and there was a, an amusement park there. I think it was called Liceberg, and it was this great, beautiful little place. And they shut it down to the public, and and Sophia Loren and her son joined us that day, along with the road crew and the band and and Michael's management. And so we got in the bumper cars, and I didn't know that picture was being taken. Uh, Michael's uh, wardrobe or or a makeup girl, uh, Karen Fay, actually took the picture and gave it to me two days later. But I was, we were all going in circles and I was just sort of sitting still waiting for someone to move. And Michael just had rammed me from behind. <laughs> and he was laughing his ass off at me. And, and so they captured the picture right at that moment. And, and, and it was, you know, it was just one of those things, but he loved having fun. You know, we, we got on the, um, they had this big Viking ship there. My stomach couldn't handle it too much longer, but they had a Viking ship that does this back and forth and it goes higher, a little higher. I sat towards the middle of it and across from me was Sophie Loren's son. 
And Greg and Cheryl Crow were, I think, in back of me a few rows. Sophia Loren was way back with Michael. And the rest of our band were in front of me on the other side. And as we got through the first part of the ride, we and we went as high as you could go and then settled back down. I was like, okay, I'm ready to get off. I'm okay <laughs> if I get off now. Greg Fillinging yells out to the operator, one more, one more for the Gipper, one more. And I went, no. <laughs> when we came off that second round, I ran for a bench and I laid down green <laughs> while everybody else enjoyed the rest of the, the, the park. I, I couldn't handle it. <laughs> uh, I didn't get sick, but but I, I just was not enjoying it. And they were on these big, you can hear Michael screaming when they went on the, there's like a log water ride where you're in a log and it's floating in water and it goes down a waterfall there. And, and you could hear Michael screaming and all of them just loving it, you know, mm -hmm. but that's who he was, you know, and, and on the big, on the victory tour, uh, we were in Dallas and I'll never forget. It was so bizarre. We were backstage and Jermaine and Michael had this, this love hate relationship, like a brotherly, I love you now, but don't piss me off. You're pissing me off. No, I love you. You know, right. and, and, and it was, it was, it was organic. It wasn't like there was a, you didn't, there was no walls between them or anything like that. There was just moments where they probably disagreed on something. There was moments where they couldn't hug each other enough. We're backstage and all of a sudden I see grapes go flying in front of me. Then I see peanuts flying in front of me. Then water bottles are flying, then bowls of fruit. And the Jacksons were having a big food fight backstage and Michael was at the center of it. So that's the kind, you know, like they, I think the way they got rid of tension you know, when it was, was through humor or laughter. And that's what Michael liked. Like he, he was shy with people he didn't know because mm -hmm. look, I mean, if, if you're a major star, if you're a McCartney, a Stevie Wonder, a Michael, um, Pavarotti, it, 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 you know, Celine Dion, whatever, uh, Whitney Houston, everyone wants a piece of you 24 hours a day. So, and I observed this with Michael. So everyone wanted a piece of Michael. You know, some band members want to talk to Michael all the time. Some guys want to do this and they're dancers and they're this and press and management. Everyone wanted a piece of Michael. And sometimes all Michael wanted to do was just like go to go to a, a zoo and go look at the animals. Right. Or just get away from the music thing. And so you could see like there was a wall around him sometimes where he just wanted his space like any normal person would, um, you're having a bad day. You don't necessarily want your best friends over to start talking about what a great day they had. You want to reflect on what, what, what you're going through or what, what, what's the next step? What am I, what am I trying to achieve here? And you could see Michael's gears were always going. Mm -hmm. So when he was opened up and he was laughing with you and being a part of it, you knew that he had a lot of peace in his life. He was, and the bad tour, when we, when we did the reunion, one thing that one of the um, major uh, coordinators of that tour said, you know, they said, you guys were very fortunate and Michael loved you all. And you need to know that was Michael's favorite because Michael was in full control. It was his first solo tour. And he was, there was no pressure, like to understand, he had done off the wall thriller and bad all of them selling, outselling each other and just building, building, building. After he did bad, now he's competing against himself. If, mm -hmm. if you're thinking in business terms, now he's like, how do I top off the wall thriller and bad? Off the wall, I, wrote, I wore out three mm -hmm. vinyls trying to learn how to play Greg's parts. When I, when I got Thriller, I bought the cassette to put my, my BMW I had at the time and I would literally pull over to park and play the music and just go, listen, PYT, like, this is ridiculous, yeah. you know, or, or whatever songs were on there. Like you just, I mean, everyone, I know Thriller was a big song for a lot of people. For me, it was some of the other ones, you know, and, and um, uh, on Off the Wall, it was Stevie's song. Um, I can't help it if I wanted to. Um, it, was, it was the Stevie Wonder song on the Off the Wall album. Uh, looking in the mirror, uh, da, 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 da. Um, I'm trying to remember the title of it. Anyway, just, it was so, we came out of a disco decade 
not that disco was all bad. You know, Donna Summer stuff was brilliant. The Bee Gees were brilliant. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of good stuff. But all of a sudden, Michael hits and he bridged that gap with the funk and the rhythm. Still, some of the hi hat, the the JR drum, disco sort of hi hat stuff, but on a level we never heard. And then into Thriller, which was like kind of Michael Sergeant Pepper of, if you will, of of his career. Mm -hmm. And then Bad had more number one hit singles on it. You know, uh, Man in the Mirror, The Way You Make Me Feel, Can't Stop Loving You. I mean, it, Dirty Diana. I mean, it just it just kept going. So by the time he got to his uh, to um, not history, um, Dangerous. Now he's competing against his pr previous albums. And Quincy was not on that record. And he had tried new things. And. And, and at the same time, our industry on a business model took a huge, huge hit. CDs came out mm -hmm. in the early 80s, around 83, 84. Now people were taking CDs and ripping them and giving them to their friends. Mm -hmm. Royalty checks weren't coming in anymore like they were. All this stuff started turning around. Record labels weren't taking the money and developing it into new artists. They were taking that cat extra $18 a record and buying yachts, women, drugs, uh, enjoying life, if you will, for those who thought they were. And it didn't get reinvested the way the, the original business models used to. The original business model where the artist would come out, record label would cough up the money. They would do an album and see where the artist sits, with how the songs, how the producer, how the song hit the radio. And they knew it would either hit or it wouldn't, but they were committed for at least three albums. The second album would get more promotion. People were more familiar with it. It would start to sell and it would start paying back what the first album costs were. And by the third album, all of a sudden, with the right production team, songwriting, the record label executives like Mo Austin and Bruce Lundville and uh, 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 Walter Yetnikoff and all these guys and Tommy Mottol, afterwards uh, the other um, Clive Davis, they all knew songs. They knew how to develop their artists and what songs to put with them and what producers. Look at Whitney Houston and so on. So by the third album, you've, they've paid back all the costs and now they're making money. Now they're stars, you know. Now, it, and, and what happened is now that the royalties weren't coming in, they were getting more frugal with budgets. They should have invested it and kept it there for development, but they didn't. They bought bigger buildings. They did vacations. They did what they were going to do. Mm -hmm. uh, not everybody, and that's not to insult any you know great executive out there who who had incredible ethics. And there, there's a lot of very ethical people as well. But there was a lot of people who took advantage of that income. Um, then with Napster and and streaming, um, I remember listening to an interview, I think it was Lady Gaga, she had over a billion hits and she got a check for $1,400. Now, to me, that's criminal, you know? And, and, and the, the, the worst of it is songwriters who craft spending eight hours, 10 hours a day coming up with songs and writing and getting together and going, they're getting no more money. They're not getting paid because there's no royalty money. Mm -hmm. So now all these great songs are disappearing by these great songwriters. And a lot of them, like Diane Warren and stuff, are kind of moving more into film than they are supporting artists. Um, not to say that's 100% true, but I mean, I'm seeing it more um, where they're trying to get their songs placed in films because that's still a big audience. But most of the artists now that I see are driven by how many thumbs up and likes you're getting on social media. It's not necessarily talent. When you look at the area, so you, you were... How old were you when you when, when Michael came out with Thriller? Eight, you said? Uh, uh, well, yeah, I mean, if that was at 81, 82, I was in uh, probably second grade when Thriller hit. So during that decade of the 60s, 70s into mid 80s, every artist was unique. Every artist, Crosby, Stills and Nash, Hattie yeah. LaBelle, Stevie Wonder, Marvin yeah. Gaye, uh, Chicago, Blood, Sweat and Tears, Led Zeppelin, Jethro Tull. It, it didn't matter what genre, it, you know, um, uh, half the country artists then, even if you didn't like the music, you knew they were great. Mm -hmm. 
they paid their dues. They had to be at a certain bar to get a record label deal. It wasn't like everyone got a deal because someone liked them at the local, you know, country store. It was, you had to really prove and pay your dues and you had to be good. And, you know, I mean, look at Conway Twitty and, and uh, George Jones and George Strait and all these guys in Nashville, Willie Nelson, they've been plugging that way for decades before they got actual, you know, bite in the industry, Johnny Cash, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. and, and so it didn't matter the genre. If you liked R&B, if you liked Sinatra, if you liked, you know, Dion Warwick, or it didn't matter, the Carpenters, there was everything you heard on the radio from the 50s, 60s, 70s, every artist was unique into the 80s. George Michael came out, everyone was blown away. You know, mm -hmm. George Michael was like, where'd this guy come from? And yeah. Whitney Houston, she pops up. It's like, wow, there's still greatness, you know, and Michael was there and so on. And Depeche Mode, you know, and that sort of stuff, like these, all these bands that were so unique and brilliant. And then all of a sudden, this homogenation starts coming in. And, and really the last of the generation, for me, it's an opinion, it's not a given. But the Foo Fighters and Chris Cornell, for me, were the last of these artists that had a voice that was their own. They weren't trying to be like all the other producers. And, you know, um, and I say that along with Cornell and, and, um, and, and the Foo Fighters, like Justin Timberlake, another talented guy who could play the instruments, sing, arrange, choreograph his show. He, he learned a lot from Michael, I could tell. And the same with Usher, you know, I mean, there's a lot of guys who who did uh, Jimmy and Terry say it the best. You're only as good as the shoulders you stand on. Wow. And, and, and that is a really pertinent thing for me to hear them say that, because you look at some of the artists now, like I'll, I'll turn on SNL and I'll watch that and I'll see some of these artists. And I'm like, no, it's yeah, I'm a little jaded because of the artists I got to work with in my life. But we know what greatness is. Let me put it this way. Someone said, got a Ferrari. It goes zero to 65 in 3.2 seconds. You want to feel that? Here's the keys. And someone says, here, I've got this, this Fiat or VW. It does go zero to 65. It might take you longer to get there. It still does 65. But you know the difference when when something's great and something's mediocre. And that's where the music industry sits with me now is it's almost like the emperor has no clothes. Everyone is I, I'm hearing from is so afraid to say this sucks. This model sucks. Artists aren't making the money and the songwriters are, are not there anymore. And the material we're hearing are beats with some overlaid vocal that's not a bunch of guys or girls in a studio going let's come up with something different you know it's not like you know i, I can only see i could just picture pink floyd like david gilmore sitting in his living room going i've got a guitar part i'm going to call up the drummer nick mason hey nick i got this guitar yeah come up with the drum beat i'll call you tomorrow no these guys get in the studio and they create magic. And as that magic is created, it's captured on tape or whatever Pro Tools, whatever they're using now. But there's a synergy when people get together and create something incredible. Um, watching the Dr. Dre documentary, um, Jimmy Iovine, uh, the, the um, I forgot what they called, it was a series. And there was a great scene where they're talking, you know, where they're, he's producing Tupac. And you just knew California Love was going to be a hit. There was something about it. It was different than everything else. It was, it was greatness. It was a vision. It was the vibe. I, I know nothing about rap, so I, I, can't, I can't tell you who's great and who's not. I can only tell you when it, when it affects me emotionally, mm -hmm. it means something. And when I heard that song, I was like, all right, well, I'm not a rap fan, but boy, that was a great song. You know, and, and there's things like that that'll happen. And so I hope one day the, the cycle will come around where the business model 
favors the production of developing artists again. And I mean artists. I'm not talking about people who come up with great drum beats or have a new gimmick or they have the greatest pair of sunglasses and it got a million likes on YouTube. I'm, I'm talking about the talent. Like, you know, like for instance, Donny Osmond, he's on his 63rd album. Now, now he's been around. I remember seeing him when he was four years old with Andy Williams on, on his TV show. And he's still creating great music and he's still doing things. He has his own fan base, you know, He's not trying to pretend to be Michael or George Michael or Marvin Gaye. He doesn't assume anything like that. But but what I do know is that he's consistent and true to his art and true to his audience. And there's not many artists that can say that, you know, and the ones that are they're the legacy, you know, like Fleetwood Mac are still around so they can still do a gig and make money. Kenny Loggins, you know, but even half the bands that are legacy aren't original members. I don't think there's original members of, of Foreigner without Lou Graham. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't think, you know, Chicago have, you know, their horn section in Robert Lamb, but the rest of the band's not, you know, Satara and so on. So, you know, like, like Journey came out, they have, they have a new singer in the band. Um, and now I think Narada is going to be playing drums with them. It's going to be great, but it's not the, the Steve Perry journey that right. we all went, holy cow. Well, and, you know, uh, you were talking about as far as being in the same room, that was one of the things with Frank Sinatra, who I love. And we've talked about uh, almost everybody you've mentioned. We've talked about them at one time or another, especially George Michael. Uh, Zoe and I love us some George Michael, too. But Frank Sinatra, until the end, he refused to record unless it was with his full full piece band. And, you know, and his thing was the kind of the same thing. And, and I know we're running a little bit long and I do want to get to hearing about um, Iron Mountain Entertainment uh, Services, because I we've talked a lot on this podcast um, on this show about uh, hypnosis and other uh, people moving into the space, a lot of the legacy artists, as Rory yep. refers to them, selling their assets. We've also talked about uh, different ways they monetize that, but he's actually involved in a program. And so for like the last 15 minutes we got, Rory, can you give us, can you tell us about the Iron Mountain um, project and what it's doing for musicians right now? So in the era now where legacy artists and up and coming artists what we're trying to do is teach the up and coming artists. Like, for instance, we, you know, I, I listened to a story that I think it was Kendrick Lamar, how he idolized Dr. Dre. Never thought he was going to be an artist like he became. So you never know who's going to be the next hero or the next big artist. But they never think about budgeting for archiving their material or that cassette demo or that DAT demo or whatever their Pro Tools demo is worth something now they think it's just a demo it's just a you know i'll get to the real thing in the studio but this is where the you know where it's at so what we're trying to do is help the legacy artists that have decades of tapes mm -hmm. educate them and help them grab their assets and then we scan all the metadata that goes with that asset. So if it's a two inch 24 track and it has a track sheet about every instrument on there and if there was signal you know, noise reduction processing, whatever notes are on there, it all gets scanned. The tape, usually if it's taped from the 60s, 70s, 80s, we have to bake it uh, in a convection oven at 110 degrees for about eight hours because the oxide on the tape after all these years used to be made with whale oil and yeah. they changed the formula. And so the oxidation is taking the film away from the tape and so if you try to play it on a tape machine, it'll shred the material right off the tape. So what they do is they bake it. Uh, they have a formula for how with the temp it's a low temperature. It's about 105, 110 degrees for about eight to 10 hours. They take the reels off, of course, so it doesn't affect melting anything. Uh, the, the metal off, they bake it, they put it back together. Then they're able to get a play off the tape machine and capture it at a high resolution audio. Um, CDs are 44.1 kilohertz. We captured it at 192 and sometimes even higher. So that's 192,000 samples per second. And so 
it'll be available in 100 years from now, people will be able to hear close to the quality that was there. Or let's say, uh, I wish I could say this, but let's say just in fact, I'm Frank Sinatra. I've got decades of, of all these great songs. My favorite album of his was in the Wee Small Hour. Um, oh, yeah. It was uh, 1955. Nelson Riddle was the arranger. And it's an album that's just every song in there, you just go, ah, oh, because my parents listened to it. I listened to it. And, and my kids listened to it growing up. So think if those tapes were lost or those masters weren't saved, what a loss that would be if we didn't have those special albums now. So now what's happening is the estates uh and people like Irving Azoff, whether they be you know the managers of the artist or the attorneys for the artist um or or you know the artists themselves will say i've got a warehouse of two inch and quarter inch tape so what we do is we have we have a great archivist too um and she'll help evaluate what is critical uh, in other words what should get digitized right away? Because it's it can you know there's cost involved in all this, so you don't want to overwhelm and say here it's you know a million dollars for like you know ten decades of, of tape. You you can batch it, you know where you go. Okay, yeah, here's a tape with um, uh, you know, here's Paul McCartney, and Jimi Hendrix screwing around cassette, 1968. Well, that's invaluable. So they'll take those nuggets and, and they'll go ahead and digitize them and put them in what we call the smart vault. Because when the client has this, they, they have levels of, of access too. So if you're the artist and you only want you and your manager to have access to these files, you give a, 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 a certain level to get into them. If, let's say, you just want your assistant or your, your uh, publicist to have access to see what's there, but they can't pull it out. They can go in there and they can see the files. They could see the video, a low res videos of what you've done. Um, for instance, we just now I can I can say it now because we just did deal. But Lady Gaga has now become part of the Iron Mountain thing, and and so I saw uh, you know there's some some video clips of some of the shows she had done, and there's some assets like even things like projections that she would put on the screen while the audiences were coming in. All those little assets and nuggets are there. Or when she announces on stage that she's bringing out or, or that, you know, ladies and gentlemen, Beyonce or Ariana Grande, maybe she wants to put that in a documentary. So, right. so they can go in there and pull this stuff and they know where all their assets are. They know how to monetize on all this stuff. It's all documented. It's all broken down. You can do it by the year, by the concert by the project. Um, it, it's phenomenal. And the interface, like if you if you look at a cloud thing like uh, um, Amazon Web Services, you're dealing with a lot of backslashes and, and code and you can see it, but it's it's cryptic and and there's a lot of hidden fees there. The thing what I like about what I do is I'm, I'm not a salesman. I've never been a salesman. I've been a musician. But what I do do is stand behind what i believe in and i really believe these assets are so important yeah. if not now mick fleetwood's kids will be thankful one day when right. they can get the when they re-release a rumors remaster or, or like a documentary of rumors and you know 25 years from now when when that generation's gone but their kids will be able to go we can we can put this on tv and and dad left us some money, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it's not all about that, but that's a part of it, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, Tom Petty left us way too early, and I'm hoping his family, you know, his family have a legacy to live on. Oh, mm -hmm. God, I love Tom Petty. And and so there's, you know, there's just, you know, and and it's it's like with Pat Leonard. I mean, you know, kid came out of Chicago, came here to do the Victory Tour. He got a call to to be musical director for uh, Madonna. He auditioned, and 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 he he was writing songs all along. He wrote "Live to Tell," mm. you know, just as it, one of his songs that he was going to do for whoever he's going to do it for. And she yeah. heard it and went, "I want to do that." And and so Pat all of a sudden has a new career in music, and he's got "Live to Tell," "Oh Father," "Like a Prayer," uh, you know, "Cherish," "Papa Don't Preach." All I mean, just 
it's like you watch these guys and they, they're not thinking about where those tapes are going to be 30, 40 years from then. Mm -hmm. So now, fortunately, Pat saved all his tapes. And, and uh, I think it was a primary wave just announced that they bought his catalog. So, you know, um, we're, he's trying to figure out how they're going to handle his tapes and so on. But so my primary goal is to help artists realize the value of their assets even the cassette demos from the 70s maybe it's like i mean think about it i mean did eddie van halen think he was going to be like oh. like reinventing guitar he was a fan of eric clapton and jimmy page mm -hmm. he didn't know what was going to happen when he was 15 and all of a sudden he reinvented guitar and i guarantee every cassette demo he and his brother alex did are worth millions now oh yeah and right. hopefully wolfgang has <laughs> you know has that left with him so you know th that's just one story but there's millions um um oh god why am i going blank the great songwriter composer who passed away a couple years ago kind of like bob dylan uh he wrote um hallelujah why am i going blank oh leonard uh leonard leonard cohen? Leonard cohen. yeah yeah leonard cohen's got decades of legacy work mm -hmm. and um i'm sure his, i'm hoping his son adam manages that catalog correctly you know and, and i love what you're doing at iron mountain because we talk about you know assets and everything so much uh on the show here and i think it just ties it up beautifully in in a nice bow and holy crap rory i i the stories that you have um the life you have lived i wish i could have been a fly on the wall for any of it and and i just i it sincerely from the bottom of my heart i want to have you back on the show absolutely um yeah oh, you. And, you guys have been great yeah and and more stories uh zoe and stormy do you guys have anything as we round this out i want to make sure you guys don't have any questions or anything for rory i just wanted to make sure you were going to say exactly what you said getting them back on the show because you were absolutely incredible oh yeah we could the, have kept what talking you shared to you or listening to you for hours so yeah please come back another time and, and thank you well, i'd love to i mean, I mean you know listen I, there's not a day i don't feel blessed you know I, it's just i i look back and go yeah that was uh that was a good run you know? yeah well and it's still going i mean yeah oh yeah you're still yeah you're still, still helping, helping musicians, musicians and... exactly <laughs> get out of my head <laughs> <laughs> yeah and and so seriously rory the i i cannot thank you enough for coming on the show and i am i'm going to be counting down the days until we can have you back and because i know that we only scratch the surface and i really yeah. do from a money perspective want to dig in more of how iron uh, i almost said iron maiden because of rocker uh, iron mountain helps musicians especially because that's one of the things that we've covered you know a lot on this show yeah. but sincerely rory thank you so much and and so plug all your stuff where can people find you or where can they find out more about you or more about iron mountain I, I, you know they can go i it, i believe it would just be iron mountain entertainment services they could look up um and and we have an office in hollywood we have underground salt salt mines in in boyers and in, in uh, pennsylvania we have offices in New Jersey, New York, Nashville, London, Paris. And so we have an amazing team. I, I have a, a manager, Beth, who's just so plugged in. She just knows, like, I'm a music guy. I'm not a business guy, right? So, so this is the interesting part. I have decades of relationships, but I don't ever deal with the money side and all that. So what's great is I can be passionate about why their assets are so valuable. Mm -hmm. right. And I have a team that can help them financially figure out how to manage that and how they want to manage that. If the audience could ever see anything, it's a documentary called The Black Godfather. You want to talk about money and figures and business. It's called The Black Godfather, Clarence Avant. I've kept hearing his name since I was 18, 19. They, he helped make Jimmy and Terry their career. He guided them in the right direction. He also did this with Babyface, but he also discovered Jim Brown and made him an actor from a football player. He discovered Bill Withers. This guy, and he's Quincy Jones' best friend, but he's a background guy, never takes bows, never likes the limelight. But what this guy has done for the music industry and the business of the music industry 
it's a documentary must see of the Black Rock Party. And Zoe and I love love documentaries, so we will see it. And and yeah. we will normally we have questions we ask Rory, but we're just gonna. It's been so wonderful. Yeah, we're just gonna we're gonna just wrap it up because okay. we can. Yeah, because we can. When you we're come back, you back. On, yeah. Oh yeah, when you come back on, then we'll get to that part. But um, again, a thousand thank yous, Rory and. Uh, everybody you can Thank follow you. us yeah absolutely follow us on social media you know where we are finances at f word Thank you so much. Rory Kaplan you guys is who you just got done fucking hearing from and with that if Zoe and Stormy doesn't have anything I think we are done. Thank That's you Zoe. Right. Thank Stormy. you. Thank you Rory. No, thank you. Thank you for listening. If you like the show please rate and review us and tell your friends. So I'm like, I don't think this guy, I was like, I don't think this guy thinks that he, I think he thinks I'm spam or I'm junk. And then finally I'm like, okay, I'm going to fucking take the picture that we took together when I was wearing my shirt, bam, I love MJ. And so then he was like, oh, I remember you now. And I'm like, yes, finally, you know? So I am, dude, I am so fucking excited to have you on the show. And I want to, obviously we're going to talk a lot about MJ, but I want to hear about all of the stuff that you're doing too, um, because you have, you know, you've been in the music industry for so long and the show is about music and money. So we just talk about the finances behind stuff. We talk about um, the music business as a business. And I mean, you know, so everything you're doing, yeah. So everything you're doing, I wanna, I wanna totally, like I wanna make sure we get to that. Now, if for some reason it starts dragging on, I might give you like a little like sign just because after a certain point, listeners start dropping off and I wanna That's make true. sure that they, they hear everything that you have to say. Now, one thing I want to, um, I wanna address before we start like recording for the episode, do you wanna address the allegations with Michael or no? Cause I don't want to give you any surprise bullshit. And if it comes no, up, no, I, just... I, I have an honest opinion about it. Cause I've known him for so long and I have, I, I love Michael to this day. I never believed he was guilty of anything. I, I knew him for a long time. And like I said, I'll say in the interview, every time I was with him and this is two major tours, if there was any kids around, he had spent hundreds of thousands of dollars shipping kids from terminal cancer, children's hospitals to the gig. Um, like special ambulances and all that kind of stuff with their family stuff to be on stage with us on the encore. Mm -hmm. um, even in his hotel room, we were, you know, hanging out or he was dancing or working with stuff and they'd be watching movies, you know, someone was there. It wasn't like this. And, you know, like I said, this whole pedophilia thing that, that people were hanging on to dear life to, to, to bring him down, never saw it. I've been, you know, this is from 84 to 89 that I spend time with them. Nothing like that. Mm, okay. You know? so, so for me, it can be brought up, but I'll stand up for them because it's just the truth from my eyes, you know? Um, yeah, no, and, 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 and we, we love Michael Jackson on this well, show. I don't know if you can see, I don't know, let me get out of the way. Yeah, we can oh, see there it is. Yeah. So that, that poster, mm -hmm. um, I'll tell you the history of that. So we were we had our last leg in europe and our last week was in the uk we had been there a couple of times we sold out seven shows at wembley and this after the last show at wembley we went to milton Ke Keynes, um just north of um of uh london and then we went to liverpool as we we're leaving milton Keynes. This guy was out as our bus was leaving with all these posters of Michael. And I went, you know, I kind of like to have one. So it was like 50 pence or whatever it was. So gave the guy the money. He gave me the poster. And, and when we got to the next gig, I rolled it up neatly and I put it in one of my keyboard trunks. And I asked my road crew, just take care of us till we get back to, to LA. So when we got back, the, the fun thing about being with Michael on the tour was that every night there was a celebrity 
And sometimes, when I say a celebrity, that's an understatement. There was an iconic person every night backstage. Mm -hmm. If it wasn't Robin Williams and Dustin Hoffman, it was Princess Diana and Charles. It wow. was Sophia Loren for a week on tour with us. Wow. Uh, uh, Elizabeth Taylor spent a couple of weeks with us on tour. Marlon Brando was out there with, with us because his son Miko was our tour manager kind of thing for the band. And he was in the Rock My World video. Yeah, that's I right. And yeah. And Miko was in Thriller. He sat right behind Michael in, in Thriller in the theater. Oh, I'm going to have to rewatch that. Yeah. And so anyway, I thought it would be really nice is to get the band to sign this poster and Michael before the tour ended. So we had a couple of, we had a couple of shows at the LA Sports Arena and Elizabeth Taylor was there and Rob Lowe was there and and um, and then all the band. And so um, as before the show and after the show, I just took the poster and, and, and when I got to Michael, it was really funny. He starts to sign his name. He goes, well, who am I signing this to? And, and he, I said to me, and he goes, oh, and so then he went, oh, love to Rory, <laughs> you know, instead of just Michael Jackson. Mm -hmm. So it was really funny. But so I had it framed and, and it's, you know, like Greg, uh, Philly Gain, Cheryl Crow, um, John Clark, our guitarist, Jennifer Batten, um, Ricky Lawson, our drummer, um, Dorian Holly, one of his singers, I think Daryl Finnessy. Um, who else was that? Don Boyette, our, bass, our bassist, the dancers. Um, uh, Dominic Lucero, who I thought was a wonderful guy. He passed away, I think of cancer, like a few years after the tour. And he was young. He was in Janet's videos. And, and I think he was in Michael's, uh, the way you make me feel with Eddie mm. and Eddie's still around and great choreographer. Um, the only one I didn't get was Vince Patterson, who actually, uh, was the choreographer, uh, for the tour. But if you remember the end of beat it, there was two guys, Michael Peters, the black guy, mm -hmm. the other one was uh, Vince Patterson. And mm. Vince was the choreographer for the bad tour. Yeah, they uh, were the one who were fighting, right? Yeah, they, they were the ones to fight at the end. And and Vince, what an incredible man. I mean, like, if there's any con so I watched the movie This Is It. And I I know how Michael was. I don't know how else to put it. He was like a thousand percent energy, full control every detail like he would say hey let's do this song and he'd call vince over and vince would be very very uh transparent you didn't even know he was around but he had a clipboard and a pencil and michael said let's go to dirty diana i want the lights to do this at this speed i want to do this i'm going to turn around and this blah blah and vince would take these notes and go to the lighting crew and choreograph what michael wanted lighting wise and and what the dancers should do. And it was very detailed. Michael was on every ounce of the show. In other words, there wasn't from the time the lights came up in the show till we ran off on the encore. That was all in Michael's head before we even did the tour. Wow. So, it, it, I mean, in a big way, not just like, um, I have a concept, let me think about it. He knew how everything was going to be. Was, was Vince the one who passed of AIDS? Uh, no, no, that was Michael Peters, I believe. Mm, okay. Uh, Vince is with us and, and. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah, He's doing a lot of projects, I think on Broadway. Like he's, he's been a big choreographer on Broadway too. Um, and worth looking up. I haven't seen what Vince has done in a while, but just, we had a, um, um, I don't know if he was there with this. I can't remember. Yeah, he was. We had a, an incredible 25 year reunion of the bad tour at the Sony picture lot and vince made it and it was really pretty much all cheryl crow couldn't make it she was out of town but uh, uh greg filling gains and the, the immediate band was there uh dorian and daryl are, are a couple of our singers uh, dancers were there vince patterson was there michael's estate and we had the, it was like brothers and sisters it it, it it's, you know, there's a few tours you do in your life. I, I don't know, you guys probably have business relations, whatever, where you go through the week or the month and you have a lot of meetings with people and business things and you do the business and you, you know, you go to a lunch meeting or you do a contract or you do whatever you're doing and you're on to the next thing. And I've been 
doing this since I was 17. I went to high school with Steve Picaro, Steve Lukather from Toto, um, all those guys. Eddie Van Halen, we're all doing Battle of the Bands against each other, Randy Rhodes. So we all kind of grew up in the same neighborhood. So you get to this point in your life, you just go, yeah, it's another gig, it's another tour, it's another album. Something about the Victory Tour and the Bad Tour. And for me also, Donny Osmond right after the Bad Tour, where it's family and we're all in touch. And when something happens to anybody, we're, you know, we're either rooting for them for something good that happened or we're mourning as a family. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we just recently lost John Clark, who was our guitarist on the Bad Tour. And it was devastating. I mean, it was it was really kind of crazy. But um, anyway, so, so yeah, I mean, all those people, you know, that you don't think are, are major people that are in the limelight, like Vince Patterson. So my comparison was watching This Is It. Michael seemed about 35% of what he was doing on the Bad Tour. In other words, it looked like um, Kenny Ortega was running the show and, and Michael was going through the steps. But and this is just as an observer knowing what it was like. Like if I didn't know anything, I would go, oh yeah, it's Michael doing a rehearsal. But also our musical director, Greg Fillingaines, I don't know if you guys are aware of who he is or, or his, his background. Greg played keyboards on all of Michael's records. He's Quincy Jones' first call. Okay. He was Stevie Wonder when he was 17, 18 years old. Nice. He played on Songs of the Key of Life. Wow. Um, he's a prodigy. You can tell Greg any song. You can say a Marvin Gaye song or the King and I uh, Broadway play or a Beatles song or, or a Eurythmic song. It doesn't matter. You tell Greg and he'll say, okay, what key? And he'll play it like he wrote the song. And, and, I, and I kid you not, we, he would do this to me and I, I would, my jaw would be on the floor every time we do a sound check. There was a period of time where I would go out to the house board because sometimes we could tell the sound wasn't right. And so he and I would trade off going out to the sound board during sound check and just make sure our keyboards sound the way we wanted them to sound. And so he goes, what do you want me to play? And I said, the king of I. 